everyone. Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Brittany, and with me, as always, is Amber. Hello. So, what are we drinking today? More red wine. Diet Sam's Cola. <laughs> oh, man. Aren't we predictable? I'm telling you. This could just be called the Rex Goliath and Diet Sam's Cola show at this point, I think. <laughs> Like, we're True Crime Buzz, sponsored by Rex Goliath and Diet Sam's Cola. <laughs> yeah. So, you have had me on pins and needles. <laughs> what is your personal true crime story of the week? <laughs> you wouldn't tell me. I hate that I put you on pins and needles because it's not that interesting. I just wanted to <laughs> save it for the podcast because it's been a good week until this morning. So, I work from home and I complain that I need to get more exercise, but then I do shit like, I don't know, put snacks in the drawers of my desk so that I don't have to get up and walk to the kitchen to get them. Well, my cat, he's adorable and I love him more than life itself, but he is an asshole and he knows how to open drawers and cabinets and everything. People come to our home and they see child locks on everything and they're like, you don't have kids. They think we're weirdos. It's for our cat. Our cat <laughs> knows how to get into stuff. So, I put some little brownies those little fiber one brownies because i'm trying to be healthier in my desk drawer yeah and i came in this morning to get ready for work and i opened the door to my office and he had opened the drawer pulled the box of brownies out and ripped open like three packages of them and there was little brownie bits all over the floor oh, he had ate like no. at least a half of one. Oh, and it's filled with fiber you think he's gonna have the shits he hasn't yet <laughs> He's got a litter box. He knows where it's at. So I don't know. But Ooh. I was just so mad. This is why we can't have anything nice. That's right. It's Bernard's fault. I mean, you've it's been to our fault. house. People say we look like mm -hmm. we, we live like serial killers because everything is like in its place and everything is very like bare bones. It's because we have an asshole of a cat and he tears down everything. No, I think your house is so clean and organized. And I didn't even notice the child locks. Probably because I just assume everywhere I go has child locks. <laughs> Yeah. Nope. They're for our cat. Well, what's your true crime story? You know. You know what it is. And what it is, is that I was in the middle of a shower the other day. And I had conditioner in my hair. I had soap on my leg. I was shaving my legs. And then the water, it just goes out. Just in the middle of my shower. No water. I'm not talking like a drizzle. Like it turned off, pretty much. Just off. It went and then just shut off. So then I knew, I knew that it was the people that own the land that we live on, okay? And they do this all the time. There's always well issues. I don't know what the deal is, but I knew they turned it off. Oh. And I was heated, boy. I was heated. So you share a well? Yes. I can only take a shower when my youngest is napping because otherwise I have kids in and out of the bathroom. I can't have my eyes on them. Right. That was my serene moment, and it got interrupted. So I got dressed. I went outside with a towel on my head. I was about to meet with my <laughs> therapist. I didn't even care and was, like, yeah. yelling at the workers. I look like such a Karen, but I honestly don't even care because now I had conditioner in my hair and one hairy leg and one shaved leg. <laughs> like, and was going to have to go up to my kid's I'm school sorry. that way. Like, Oh, that's the worst. It was the absolute worst. And, like, it wasn't back on for the rest of the evening. I had to wait till the next day to shower again. <gasps> oh, no. Yes. It wasn't even like a, oh, sorry, ma'am, and then they turn it back on and you can, like, continue. It was done for a while, and so you just had to deal. Yeah, and I felt bad afterwards because these people that I was yelling at are the people that work for the people that turn the well off. So... It's technically right. not their fault, but I called Matt and I was raising the hell about that. And he was like, well, you know what? Let me, let me call. <laughs> so he did. And mm -hmm. he left a message for them and they wrote back and were like, we can understand the inconvenience. And in the future, we'll find a way to try to communicate water shutoffs. And I'm like, gee, thanks. That'd be just real decent of you. So mm -hmm. it was a crime though. And my hair was a crime for 24 hours. That is the ultimate true crime. But I bet your hair is so soft now, leaving conditioner in it for that long. I don't know. It doesn't feel any more soft than usual. It just looked like I went deep diving in some uh, vegetable oil or something. It was awful. You were full on Eileen Warnos. I was. <laughs> With your one shaved leg coming out hollering at people. I probably even yelled in Eileen Warnos. That was the accent that came out. You probably did. Mm -hmm. So... I'm dying for you to tell me this story because I don't know it. I've heard of it, but I don't know the details. So 
get to, girlfriend. Ooh, girl, I got a good one today. Yes. I did not realize what I was getting myself into, and this makes at least the third or fourth episode that has done that to me. Like, Andrea Yates did that to me. I kind of knew what I was getting into, but not really. Heaven's Gate, same thing. But that ended up being like a happy, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. <laughs> we were about to have to stage an intervention. <laughs> yes. But then also, the mafia. I got myself into the mafia, and I enjoyed every bit of it, but I didn't realize all the information. I was just like, my God, I just want a, a 30 minute podcast story. I wasn't looking for like years and years of like a PhD in the history of the mafia. But anyways, I'm glad I came across this story. It's a good story. It's sad. But there was a picture that I came across somewhere that I was like, ooh, what is this about? And then I realized, holy cow, this man, not even a man, this child, this 17-year-old kid got locked away forever for three murders and was labeled as the lipstick killer. So Whoa. I was like, ooh, I need to know more information about this. Yes. Normally, we tell stories in our episodes in chronological order based on the timeline of events. However, because of the craziness of this case, I'm going to start out with the crimes and then go back. Okay, you're mixing it up today. On the afternoon of June 5th, 1945, 43-year-old Josephine Ross was found dead in her home by her own daughter in their apartment on the north side of Chicago. She had been stabbed four times in the throat with her head wrapped in either a dress or a skirt. I got different answers. Mm. She also appeared to have been cleaned up. She had been bathed. All of her wounds had been covered with adhesive tape and she was placed back in her bed afterwards. What? So it was a very odd sight for a murder. Yes. Yeah, that's weird. Dark hair was also found clutched in her hand, indicating that she had struggled with an intruder before she was killed. However, there were no valuables taken from the apartment. When questioned, her fiancé had an alibi, and so did all of her other former boyfriends, ex-husbands, friends, etc. So police had literally no suspects. Hmm. They also found no fingerprints and no obvious motive. Six months later, the body of 32-year-old Frances Brown was discovered on the morning of December 11th, 1945, in the bathroom of her apartment at the Pine Grove Hotel. She had been shot in the head twice and stabbed with a bread knife that had been driven into her neck with such force that the blade emerged on the other side of her throat. Eek. Her body had been stripped naked and rinsed of blood and her head wrapped in a towel. Sound familiar? Yes. But police again found themselves without any evidence except for one bloody fingerprint on the door jamb of the front door. But there was also one other detail that was not in the first crime. There was a super creepy message written on the living room wall using the victim's own red lipstick. It said, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Ooh. Ain't that creepy? It's creepy. It's ominous. Mm. Mm-hmm. This detail spread like wildfire throughout Chicago and made national headlines with the new monster nicknamed the Lipstick Killer. The third and final crime in today's story is arguably the saddest and the most brutal. Brittany, I'm so sorry. This is a child murder. Okay. All right. So on the morning of January 7th, 1946, a man discovered that his six-year-old daughter, Suzanne Degnan, was missing from her bedroom in their apartment, also located in the north side of Chicago. So he called the police and they arrived around 10 a.m. They found a ladder propped up outside her bedroom window along with a crumpled up ransom note in her bedroom. On the front of the ransom note, it said, quote, get $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens. And on the back of the note, it said, burn this for her safety. Mm. Reportedly, a man's voice repeatedly called the family's residence demanding the ransom, but hung up before any meaningful conversation could take place. Police questioned neighbors, friends, anyone who had been around, but nobody said they saw anything unusual the day before or the night before. This is particularly bothersome because I have a six-year-old daughter. It's like, oh. I know, I know, and I thought about that. I was like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, Brittany. It's okay. I forgive you. I love you. That's how true crime is. You have to work through it. Yeah. Someone also called police anonymously, suggesting that maybe they look in the sewers near the Degnan home. Police did, and around 7 p.m. that same night, 
Suzanne's severed head was found less than a block away, floating in a sewer catch basin, with blue ribbons still tied in her hair. Just her head? Just her head. Did they find her body eventually, or? Yeah. Okay, okay. In that same alley, they also discovered her right leg in another catch basin, her torso in a storm drain, and then her left leg found in another alley. Her arms were later found in a sewer about a month later. Mm. Poor baby. Isn't that awful? Yeah. All right, that's the worst of it. Okay. Good job. I'm proud of you. I wish I had alcohol. <laughs> Chug that Diet Sam's Cola and pretend like there's rum in it. Yes. So police searched around and they actually uncovered a laundry tub in a nearby apartment building basement across from where her head was found. And that seemed to have been where she was actually dismembered. Mm. The press decided to also give this a creepy name too. They referred to it as the murder room. So now we have a lipstick killer who's possibly dismembering children in the murder room. Okay. Chicago is a very scary place at this point. Why did they think these are linked, though? Well, the two at the beginning I can see because they're very similar and very close by. But this one's a little out there. Yeah. yeah. Chicago police would question hundreds of people, but initially told everyone they had their guy when they took in a 65-year-old janitor from the building where that murder room was located. Okay. They questioned and tortured him for two days before ultimately releasing him after he refused to confess. Wow. It was also later found out that he could hardly write, let alone, you know, spell in order to write a ransom note or scribble something like the lipstick killer did on the wall. Oh, so. that's so sad. But bless that sweet little man for not breaking down after two days of being tortured and questioned. Right? Because apparently he had to spend like... 10 days in the hospital because he had a, a shoulder out of place from the way that they treated him. Oh my gracious. Oh, poor fella. Months went by and police exhausted all the leads that they had. All they had at this point was the bloody fingerprint from the second murder, and FBI had discovered a few smudged prints on that ransom note from the third murder, but they didn't know who they belonged to. Mm. A few months later, on June 26, 1946, in a building just a few blocks from the Degnan house, a man was seen snooping around inside an apartment by the building tenant. The man, realizing he was caught, ran up the back stairs of a nearby building, but ended up cornered by two policemen where he pulled a gun. Mm. There is a slight disagreement about what happened next, but based on Officer Tiffin Constant's statement, the man pulled the trigger but the revolver misfired. So the officer fired three times with his own revolver and the burglar leapt down the stairs at him. They struggled in a fight and an off-duty officer named Abner Cunningham showed up still in his swimming trunks from spending his day off at the beach. He picked up a stack of three flower pots and repeatedly smashed the burglar in the head with them. By the Whoa. time the third pot shattered, the man became unconscious and they were finally able to take him into custody. Holy cow. What a sight that had to right? be. Right? Okay. That sounds like something out of a movie, doesn't it? It does. That doesn't even seem real. So, who was this guy? His name was William George Hirons. He was born on November 15th, 1928, to parents Margaret and George Hirons, and he grew up in the Chicago suburb of Lincolnwood, Illinois, with his parents and his younger brother, Jer. His childhood was reported as normal enough although he did grow up during the Great Depression, so his parents struggled financially and argued constantly. Mm. His father grew up in the floral business with his own father, so he opened up a couple different florist shops, but he just could not keep them open, and ended up joining the police force for the Carnegie Steel Company. His mother originally helped with the florist businesses, but when those didn't work out, she became a pastry maker at a local bakery. Oh, okay. Friends remember William as a curious boy who enjoyed tinkering with mechanical toys and drawing. He loved learning how things worked. He would take them apart, put them back together, draw all the pieces and their parts, and then draw the whole thing once it was put back together. He was just very hands-on and almost like a little engineer. Yeah, that's cute. Isn't that cute? It is. But very quickly, he would add burglary to his list of hobbies. <laughs> what? That escalated quickly, didn't it? It did. So quick. <laughs> This cute little kid, and he's like, you know what? I'm a steal now. <laughs> That's right. Well, let me uh, finish drawing this engine here, and then I'm going to go mm -hmm. rob a store. All right. Yep. When he was only 12 years old, he decided to steal for the first time. 
He worked for a local grocery store, and after accidentally shortchanging himself with a customer, he made up the difference by reaching through the crack in a chain-locked apartment door to lift a single dollar bill from an open purse inside. Wow. Just walked by, just a little bloop. Yeah. <laughs> the imagery in this is just insane. He said after that, stealing became easier, and he started doing it more and more. He claims it was mainly motivated by the actual need for money, but he would also steal random items like radios, cameras, handkerchiefs, cocktail shakers, and men's clothes. He even stole a gun, and he said this was for the sole purpose of carrying it with him as protection during his future burglaries. He wasn't trying to kill anybody. He just wanted to keep himself safe should someone come and disrupt his little hobby he has going on. Did you just say handkerchief? Yes. <laughs> okay. How am I supposed to say it? Handkerchief. Chief. Okay, Not sure. Chief. Sure. I it, it's spelled chief. It is 100% spelled chief, <laughs> but I've never heard anyone say it that way. Now, no matter how good you are, if you do it enough, you will eventually get caught. It's just bound to happen. Right. And that's what happened to William. He was arrested for the first time in June 1942 when he was just 13 years old. Gracious. I that's know. young. He was arrested for breaking into a basement locker in an apartment near his home. When he was arrested, he immediately admitted to at least nine other burglaries during the last six months. Oh my gracious. Like, oh, by the way, I also what? stole from these guys too. I'm sorry. He's the cutest little kid. He may steal, but he's just, he's adorable. Yeah, and I'm here for it. <laughs> he told his parents he got the idea for being a burglar from shows that he listened to on the radio and said that being a burglar sounded exciting. But the excitement was short-lived and the juvenile court found William guilty of all 10 counts of burglary and sentenced him to spend a year at the Gibalt School for Boys, which was a semi-correctional school in Indiana. And fun fact is also where Charles Manson was sent when he was a little troublemaker around the same age. Hmm, that is a fun little dash of fact. So other than trying to run away just to go back home three weeks after his arrival, it was documented that he was quote, obedient, cooperative, and had a good attitude towards authority. Aww. But after being released a year later in the summer of 1943, he was arrested again. William was now being arrested for, you guessed it, burglary. <laughs> it's obviously what he's into. He admitted to a string of burglaries and was sentenced to three years at St. Bede's Academy, a private school operated by Benedictine monks. Okay. For three years this time instead of a year. During his time at the school, he stood out as an exceptional student. So much so that he was labeled a gifted student, and that allowed him admission to the University of Chicago at the age of 16. Wow. Isn't that crazy? It is. It just blew my mind when I read that. Like, he steals. Yes. He can't keep his little greasy fingers off of things, but he's so honest about it. <laughs> I guess that's why I'm like, he's so cute because he's honest about it. He's not lying about it. And he's also like very hands-on and smart. You know, I'm loving this kid. So in September 1945, William enrolled in the Bachelor of Science program with the hopes of becoming an electronic engineer. He became involved in dancing classes, chess club, and even started dating. Ooh. But by December 1945, he had returned to his old habits. He just could not stay away from breaking into strangers' homes and stealing whatever he could get his fingers on. My gracious, man. Get it together. I know. Today's episode is presented by The Skin Store. For over 20 years, The Skin Store has been the number one destination for premium skincare, hair care, and beauty products. With over 8,000 different products from 300 different brands, The Skin Store has you covered for all your hair, cosmetics, supplements, and of course, skincare needs. Find your favorite brands like Elta MD, New Face, Olaplex, and more, all in one place with gifts with every purchase. Right now, The Skin Store is offering our listeners 20% off your next purchase by using the code POD. That's code P-O-D. For 20% off your next purchase at skinstore.com slash pod.list. Skin Store. Have the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Exclusions apply.
And this brings us back to that afternoon of June 26, 1946. William was the man who struggled in that fight with the police. Mm. So according to William, he said he originally went to the post office to cash a $1,000 savings bond. He had actually bought this with money taken from previous burglaries. Shocker. Mm -hmm. He had a hot date that night, so he needed the cash. And because he planned to carry so much money with him on his person, he put his revolver in his pocket. Okay. But once he realized the post office was closed, he thought, well, I need the cash. Well, I'll just go steal the cash. Yeah. Like I always do. Specifically in the building where he had stolen many times before, but as we know, he ended up getting caught and ended up in a tangled fight with the two other policemen. Yes. So once he was arrested, he was taken to the police hospital at the Cook County Jail where he was strapped to a bed and his head was stitched and bandaged because as you remember, he got knocked in the head, I don't know how many times, with the flower pots. Right. Until <laughs> yeah. he was knocked unconscious. So he had some wounds. He didn't make that date. No, he did not. He remembers very little. He said he drifted in and out of consciousness, but he does remember hearing people saying something about how he was a suspect in that Dignan case, the little girl that got murdered, and he felt someone taking his fingerprints. Whoa. Meanwhile, the police raided his parents' house, his bedroom at the university, and a locker he kept at an L station where they discovered all the random items he would steal from his burglaries. This is when he remembers different police at his bedside asking him, so how did you kill Suzanne Degnan? How did you do it? When did you do it? And at this point, no attorney was ever called for him. Illegal. This was back before Miranda rights. This was back before oh, a yeah. lot of shit. Oh, yeah, I guess so. He, he, they would never get away with nowadays. No. On the third day, he heard that his prints had been matched to the ransom note. And that the state's attorney announced that the police had officially found and arrested Suzanne Degnan's murderer. Wow. William Hiron's name was immediately plastered all over the headlines of the newspapers, and the press went into a frenzy. Police Commissioner John Prendergast was quoted as saying, I don't see how we can miss on this one. He knows he did it, and he knows we know he did it. Hmm. So confident on a kid that was stealing something, you're going to link him to these murders, but whatever. I feel like they're just grasping at straws. Honest to God. Already mm -hmm. in this part of the story. First the janitor, now this kid that liked to steal things. Yeah. And back then, you know, they didn't have DNA. They didn't have right. a lot of things. But when a child gets murdered, the community really puts the pressure on the police to find the killer. And they just, like you said, they grasp at straws. Like, you know what? This kid was caught stealing God knows what else he would do. He's probably the murderer. And then they try to link him to it any way they can. Like, they're not doing their real job like they should be doing. Right. Because they want to tell people, we got the guy. Even if they really didn't. Which is unfortunate. Especially for poor William. Yes. Meanwhile, William was still tied to the hospital bed, and police began to torture a confession out of him. This included a male nurse pouring ether on his genitals. What? Yeah. Like, I don't know who signed off on that and how they thought any of that was okay, but they were literally trying to torture him to death until he confessed. That is sick as fuck. Which is, I don't know what kind of laws were around back then, but apparently this was fine. Well, there weren't videotapes of stuff then, so they could get away with that. They could be like, oh, no, we never did that. True. It also included a detective punching him in the stomach over and over while repeating grotesque details of the recent murders. Like, trying to just get it out of him police really thought he was the lipstick killer or give him information for you know i mean because obviously he didn't have it i don't think but william was a tough dude and even after all he was going through he refused to confess he's like i didn't do it yeah i steal i don't murder people yeah on the fourth day two psychiatrists arrived and he was injected with sodium pentothal aka truth serum mm. i know you've heard of that oh yeah he then was questioned for three hours while the assistant state's attorney listened in from a distance. While under the influence, authorities claimed William officially confessed, which just sounds bananas to me. Yeah. How can that even be allowable? Like, he's drugged up. You say the weirdest stuff when you're drunk, let alone on this truth serum. I could be like, hey, y'all, I'm Dolly Parton. <laughs> like, what the hell? But apparently they were like, oh, we got him. We got him. Mm. 
They said he spoke of an alter ego personality named George Merman, who was a part of him, and he had actually committed the murders. Now, William barely remembers anything, of course. And yeah. since the original transcript to this whole thing has since disappeared, we will never know exactly what he said. But also, you got to think, like I said, you say weird stuff when you're under the influence of anything. Right. But George happened to be his middle name and his dad's name. And Merman is almost like a slurred version of murder man or murder. Okay. So George Merman. I could see how he would like just come up with that all off the cuff while yeah. he's drugged up. Like, yeah, sure. George Merman did it. He's a part of me. Like, I don't know. But either way, we'll never know. Ugh. On the fifth day, on the fifth day of questioning, William said to me, <laughs> sorry, on the fifth day, William was given a spinal tap without anesthetic. <sighs> yeah, girl. Mm -hmm. Brittany's jaw is just on the floor right now. And that's how mine was too when I was doing my research. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? A spinal tap? Oh my God. They were just straight up torturing this kid. And yes, kid, he was 17. I feel like Chicago PD owes this man an apology for the torture. Like, I don't care how many years it's been. They need to mm -hmm. release a statement and be like, hey, that was fucked up. Times were different. We should have never done that. Right? William does remember this, though, because he said he was screaming and screaming from the pain. Bet the fuck he was. Yeah. No, thank you. I don't want a spinal tap with anesthetic. Mm -mm. Like, no, thank you. Hard pass. He said, quote, for the first time, I thought of taking the blame for the murders I was accused of. So at this point, he's finally like, you know what? I'm, I'm sick of this. I can't take anymore. Moments later, he was driven to police headquarters for a polygraph test. And yes, moments later, after this spinal tap. Mm. So try as they may, he was in so much pain that the test had to be rescheduled for a few days later. Well, of course it fucking did. Surprise! So when they did finally do the polygraph, the authorities announced that the results were inconclusive. Hmm. Okay. So after being tortured, held without food, sleep, or access to an attorney for five days, William was officially indicted for assault with intent to kill, robbery, 23 counts of burglary, and three counts of murder on July 12th, 1946. So even after all that and not confessing, they still charged him with the murders. This has to be one of the most horrendous things that I've ever heard happen to someone while being questioned. That is why I said I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just heard lipstick killer and I saw the picture of the writing on the wall. And I was like, ooh, this sounds creepy. Let me check this out. I had no idea this bullshit I was getting myself into. Oh, God. He was then transferred to the county jail where lawyers hired by his parents explained that for just the burglaries alone, he was looking at life imprisonment. Even murder aside, like this guy was looking at life in jail. The state's attorney offered William a deal in exchange for the confession they were looking for to all three murders. He would be spared the electric chair and would instead receive three concurrent life sentences with a chance for parole in 20 years instead. Which okay. sounds like a pretty sweet deal if he had actually done it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great deal if you actually killed somebody. But he didn't. Or he says he didn't. Mm -mm. So for about two weeks, they kept him in solitary confinement. And while he was in there, he would rehearse the details of the crimes that were told to him by his attorneys. And then he said he was finally ready to confess. But when his day came in court in front of everyone, he bailed and denied knowing anything about the murders. He's like, nope. I don't know anything. I didn't do this. Good for him. You mm -hmm. have to sit there and rehearse lines fed to you through an attorney. Yep. Like, you probably shouldn't be confessing because you didn't do it. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. Yeah. And you best believe the state attorney was pissed. Well. Because he thought, this kid, I'm going to get him to confess. We've got our killer. He'll spend some time in jail. We're done here. But he flipped the script on him and he said, no, I didn't do it. Good for him. Live your truth, William. So the state attorney adjourned the hearing and told William's attorneys that the deal was off. So now his confession would get him three consecutive life sentences served end to end rather than simultaneously. Mm. So now he was stuck with the choice of sticking with the not guilty plea and going to trial. But at this point, 
everyone knows him as the lipstick killer. The police are obviously out for blood. Like, is he going to really get a not guilty verdict if he goes through the trial? He's not going to get a fair trial. No. And if he does get through the trial and he is guilty, he will get the electric chair. Mm -hmm. They were not playing around back then. No. It wasn't a death row and you sit on it for 15 years. It was a death row, your sentence is in three weeks. He didn't want to die. He was 17. He was a young kid and he was scared. So he decided maybe I should just confess and serve my time in prison for the rest of my life. Or maybe I could try and get out later, do an appeal, do anything I can. Right. And that's yeah. what he ultimately decided to do. Oh. He felt he had no other option. Yeah, well, he kind of didn't. So on August 7th, 1946, after spending 42 days in custody and making three attempts to commit suicide... William officially confessed to the state's attorney of how he had stabbed, shot, and killed both Francis Brown and Josephine Ross, and then went on to strangle and dismember little six-year-old Suzanne Degnan. So as agreed, he was sentenced to three life sentences consecutively and began his sentence at a maximum security prison in Statesville, and after about a month was sent to the psychiatric division of Menard. After there, he was finally sent to Dixon Correctional Center. In 1949, he started a petition to win a hearing to re-examine the evidence and the circumstances of his sentence. It took him three years, but in November of 1952, William traveled to court in Chicago, where approximately 40 witnesses testified during his 10-day hearing. But in the end, his petition was denied. I have never, <laughs> I have never cried at a single story we have told on this podcast, and I am legit fucking crying. I'm so sorry, but to be fair, I teared up too. No, when I was doing don't my apologize. <laughs> like, I mean, seriously, like this is a story that needs to be told. It's just, isn't it just heartbreaking? It's very heartbreaking. So his petition was denied, but he did not give up. For more than forty years, he attempted to win the right to a new trial, or have his conviction overturned, or his sentences reduced, or at least maybe I don't know. Given what he was originally promised, which was to run his sentences concurrently, yeah, he brought legal actions and petitions before state, federal, and appeal courts. And over the years, while his never got approved, he learned so much about the law that he was able to win parole for a lot of his fellow prisoners, just not himself. <laughs> Isn't this just like good. this? Oh. I feel like I'm just twisting the knife in your heart right now, and I'm just speaking the truth. In 1983, after years of litigation over the interpretation of the parole law and the time he served, U.S. Magistrate Gerald P. Cohn ordered that William be released on grounds that he had been rehabilitated. They were all about the whole, like, rehabilitation into society at that time. So how long had he been incarcerated at this point? Oh, my God. 40 years. Oh, bless. They're like, look, this guy, you think he murdered someone? That's fine. But he's been in here for 40 years. He's never done anything wrong. He's yes, sir, no, sir. He helps other people. Yeah. Like, he's rehabilitated. Let him out. So, William decided to finally start making preparations for his life outside as a free man. He even arranged for employment at a local orchard and a trailer there where he could live. I love it so fucking much. Yes, William. But Chicago State Attorney Richard M. Daly and seven former police superintendents formed a committee to remember Suzanne Degnan. And her surviving sister, Betty, collected signatures from local politicians to keep him behind bars. And the state senate passed a resolution against his parole. That's so fucked, though. Because, look, I get where the family's coming from with that. Because I'm sure they weren't made aware of all the things that this man went through to be no, tortured no, into a all. thing. And then, but these police do. And so they're, like, literally using this family's pain to keep the wrong man behind bars. And that's really mm -hmm. fucked. Like, yeah, that's like pissing on this kid's memory. And that's bullshit. I am not here for that. No, I'm with you. I agree 100%. I see, you know, if my sister had been brutally murdered and the police said this is the guy, yeah. would I want him behind bars? Yeah. But also, like, I want to know, why do you think it's the guy? Yeah. What evidence do you have? I wouldn't be trying to do all that if I didn't know for sure yeah, in my heart back that then, the they guy. didn't have that evidence. I know. I know. But... I literally get super emotional, obviously, about stories with kids, but also about people that are possibly wrongly convicted. I'm truly Absolutely. a believer in innocent until proven guilty. And I feel like that's not really the case Me anymore. Too. 
And that's how our court system is supposed to work. It is. But, you know. And it fails sometimes. It does. In February 1990, William once again attempted to win a post-conviction hearing, but they denied his petition. And the presiding judge pointed out that nearly 44 years had passed since he pled guilty and that everyone involved in sending him to prison was long dead. He was yeah. basically like, what's the point? Like, nice try, but this is just, it's too late. In August of 2007, the Illinois Prisoner Review Board denied his parole for the 13th time, voting 14 to nothing against his petition for release. And listen to this fucking quote. Thomas Johnson, who was a board member, said, quote, God will forgive you, but the state won't. Oh my God. Mm. I'm going to flip this goddamn computer over. <laughs> <laughs> So six decades after his confession, almost all the evidence that helped put William in jail had been discredited. The fingerprints connecting him to the crime scenes may as well have been planted. There was a theory that they weren't even there to begin with. Because originally, from what I understand, at least on the ransom note, there were no fingerprints. And then some time had passed and magically fingerprints were appearing on the note. I can believe that. Also, there was this issue with the fingerprint during the second murder on the door jam. Mm -hmm. There was a finger, a bloody fingerprint. From what I understand, the fingerprint, you could see the lines. You know how when you roll your finger into a fingerprint, it shows this side rolled into that side? Yeah. If you leave a fingerprint on a door jam, it's a flat surface and then you're done. You don't right. roll your finger on there. The fingerprint in that bloody fingerprint was rolled. Oh. Uh -huh. So they think it was planted there. Oh, that's a thousand mm -hmm. percent planted. Okay. So none of this has been confirmed as bullshit. It's just there's a lot of professionals and analysts that have looked at this stuff over time and been like, this is wrong. This is wrong. Also, independent experts looked at the handwriting matches between the ransom note and the lipstick on the wall. Yeah. First off, they're both written in weird handwriting, but they're not the same handwriting. Right, yeah. And also, they are nothing compared to William's handwriting. Like, not even close. So, I don't know where they were going with that, but it, it wasn't his handwriting. It's also a horrible rumor that may be true. That the lipstick killer wasn't even written by the murderer at all, but by a reporter who arrived at the scene before police did and decided to add an extra twist to the story. Because mm. they were all about some headlines back then, you know <sighs> what I mean? Yep, I sure do. But in the meantime, the decay of physical evidence has placed the case far beyond the reach of DNA analysis. The surviving fingerprint evidence is locked up in the vaults of the Chicago Police Department and they will not surrender it for retesting won't surrender it what and to end this on an even sadder note none of it mattered anyways because on march 5th 2012 william george hirons was found dead in his prison cell at the correctional center in dixon illinois he was 83 years old and spent 66 of those years in prison that's so fucking awful it is and an autopsy was ordered and performed i could not find the details of it but First off, he was an old man, and second off, he was known to have diabetes. So it's assumed that that's the cause of his death. Does this tear rolling down my cheek? It doesn't tear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, our listeners are going to be like, she's a baby back bitch. But, oh, y'all. I know. I'm just picturing this little sweet old man behind bars, just like, I didn't do it, guys, you know, and just making the most of his life. So and sad. dying in jail and never knowing what a real life was. You know, but this is like a situation that we as a society need to learn from because he's not the only one that's wrongfully convicted or behind bars with DNA evidence that could exonerate them. So, I mean, it's an important story. And I hope that we can all remember this and mm -hmm. that we can stop making really dumb mistakes like this. Right. But of course, with DNA technology and forensic advances every day, hopefully something like this will not continue to happen in the future. Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash truecrimebuzz and join today for access to all our exclusive content, including bonus episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TC Buzz Podcast. 
And check out our website at www.truecrimebuzz.com. Until next time, cheers. cheers.